Hi, I'm John, the MedPod engineer, Termel, and on Tuesday, February 17th, I was in the Superior Court of Ontario arguing for the return of marijuana seized by Canada Post from Terry Parker, the epileptic who proved he needed it for his epilepsy. Well, this is the statement of the case and the arguments that were made to Ontario Superior Court of Justice, Judge Tullock. The Crown Attorney was James Gorham, and... Uh, uh, it was a good three hours long, and so a lot got discussed, and we went into great depth. Okay, Ontario Superior Court of Justice, file number 2484-08, between Terence Parker, appellant, and Her Majesty the Queen, respondent. Part 1, Statement of the Case. This is an appeal of the dismissal by Judge Clements of the Ontario Court of Justice of an application... 1. Under Section 136 of the Courts of Justice Act for approval of the manner of tape recording the proceedings for applicants' personal notes. 2. Under Section 24 of the CDSA for the return of the seized controlled substance by Terry Parker, whose legitimate medical use of marijuana for epilepsy has been acknowledged by the Ontario Court of Appeal on R v. Parker and the Ministry of Health. Part 2. Summary of Facts. On or about April 24, 2006, Canada Post searched the applicant's mail and discovered a package of marijuana, which Canada Post delivered to Peel Regional Police. The Department of Justice concluded the marijuana could not be returned because, one, the applicant's exemption existed prior to the new medical marijuana regulations, two, applicant's constitutional exemption lapsed in 2004, they say, three, applicant did not have a current exemption under the new rules. Four. The June second two th on June second two thousand six, Terence Parker filed a Section twenty four application for the return of the marijuana upon five grounds, four of which are. 2. Justice Pitt's criminal court extension of the constitutional exemption granted by the Ontario Court of Appeal remains valid, despite being set aside as a default judgment pursuant to the rules of civil procedure for improper service. Justice Chapnick, sitting as a justice of the same court of just as Justice Pitt, had no jurisdiction to interfere with his judgment, and using civil procedure to set aside a criminal court remedy is inappropriate. 3. Section 4 Possession Prohibition remains repealed pursuant to Section 2.2 of the Interpretation Act once declared invalid by the Parker Court of Appeal in 2001. Despite Section 4 being resurrected by the Hitzig Court of Appeal for only being absent, not repealed, once invalidated by the court. 4. Section 7 Cultivation Prohibition and by implication Section 4 Possession Prohibition remain repealed pursuant to the Section 2.2 Interpretation Act once declared invalid by the Krieger Court of Appeal of Alberta in 2002. And 5. By the MMAR failing to mandate that Parker's doctor participate in the government's exemption program. Physician participation is not effective and Section 7 cultivation and Section 4 possession prohibitions cannot apply to Parker because he's grandfathered exemption for the sick. Justice Clements ruled that 1. Approval of the manner of the tape recording to be denied. 2. He was bound by the Ontario Court of Appeal in Hitzig to conclude that, oh, that setting aside of a criminal remedy in civil court by an equivalent judge had been confirmed as appropriate by the Ontario Court of Appeal. Three judges. Three, he was bound to accept that the possession prohibition, which had been struck down by the Ontario Court of Appeal in Parker in 2001, had been resurrected by the Ontario Court of Appeal in Hitzig in 2003. And four, he was bound to accept that the cultivation prohibition which had been struck down by the Alberta Court of Appeal in Krieger in 2002 would have been resurrected by the Ontario Court of Appeal in Hitzig in 2003, and so it was. And five, the lack of physician participation did not render the regulations ineffective. Issues and law. Unobtrusive tape recording not prohibited. In the late 1980s, the section on tape recording read, Nothing prohibits a party from unobtrusively tape recording for one's personal notes. In later years, 
in a matter approved by the court was added. Though the judge may prohibit a manner of taping, the judge may not prohibit taping itself. Offering transcripts several months down the road is no substitute for recordings available right away. Yet many judges think prohibiting a manner of taping allows them to prohibit taping. It does not. Well, the first thing I did in my presentation was to bring up the taping issue, go right to it, and ask Judge Tullock if I could tape the proceedings. So he asked the Crown what the Crown thought, and the Crown thought, well, didn't have much of an opinion about it. So Judge, but he did ask, is he asking here uh, to have Judge Clement's decision overruled, or is he asking to have a tape recorder right now? And I said both. So, Judge Tullock, without commenting on Judge Clements's refusal to let me tape record, granted me the right to turn on my tape recorder. So, now that's that argument about the tape recorder done. Seven, Chapnick had no power to set aside Pitt, J. The Pitt decision, extending the criminal jurisdiction exemption granted by the Ontario Court of Appeal, cannot be set aside pursuant to the rules of civil procedure as a default judgment, nor for improper service, when, pursuant to the general powers of the court under Section 302 of the Criminal Proceedings Act, a court may extend or abridge any prescribed time. If the court may dispense with service altogether, Improper service is not possible. And confirmation of a decision that goes beyond the jurisdiction of the court, even by a higher court, does not grant jurisdiction to that lower court. 8. Justice Clements noted that the first remedy claimed by Parker, which was to declare the law dead on Terry Parker Day, which had not been dealt with by Justice Pitt, for a declaration of the possession prohibition of becoming valid on Terry Parker Day, required a constitutional challenge. Well, that's wrong. Parker had already won his constitutional challenge to prove the law was unconstitutional in 2000. He was now only asking for the declaration that the order had taken effect on Terry Parker Day, August 1st, 2001. But because Chapnick J. thought the issue Pitt J. refused to deal with, requires a constitutional challenge. She set aside the issue that Pitt J. actually did deal with. So the Hitzig court had no power to overrule Parker. When asked where the Hitzig court got the power to resurrect a statute that had been struck down, Crown Attorney Greg Smith in R versus Nielsen and others is the only Crown Attorney to ever explain that though there was no written authority, they wouldn't have done it if they couldn't have done it, so they can. The Hitzig Court did not have the authority to order courts in Canada to ignore the Interpretation Act, that a statute declared of no force and effect was to be deemed repealed, and to follow their order that such statute was to be deemed merely absent or inoperative, not repealed, until fixed. Only Parliament can legislate a statute that's been struck down. Yet the Crown accepted the prohibition, did not cease to have effect, when declared of no force and effect by the Parker Court, it was simply inoperative until fixed by the courts, not Parliament. Well, this court-fixed law is not existing anymore because POLCOA, our acronym P-O-L-C-O-A, Parliament only legislates, courts only abrogate. 10. John Termal applied for five judges necessary in an appeal to challenge the Hitzig resurrection by three judges of the statute which had been struck down. Chief Justice McMurtry denied the application for five judges needed to overrule three. And then the appeal was dismissed for lack of five judges to overrule three. So the Hitzig resurrection has never been challenged in the courts. The Hitzig court had no power to overrule Krieger. The Hitzig Court of Appeal could not resurrect the Section 7 Cultivation Prohibition and by implication Section 4 Possession Prohibition, which had been struck down by the Alberta Court of Appeal in 2002. That's been explained in earlier posts. Though Judge Clements held he was bound by Hitzig to treat the struck down legislation as having been resurrected, no one is bound by bad law. Still, no matter what other courts say, the judge was bound by the new legislation of the Court of Appeal of Ontario, he said. 
Finally, physician participation ineffective. The Court of Appeal ruled it is reasonable for the state to insist upon doctors being in charge, despite tons of anecdotal evidence few physicians participate because their associations warn them not to. The court admits that if physician cooperation drops to the point where it becomes ineffective, the issue could be revisited. Still, the court ruled there was a sufficient number so that it cannot be said to be practically unavailable.